that time of year when different types of flu and colds are going around. And you notice as they come into the monastery, some people come down with a cold or come down with a flu. Other people don't. And sometimes the cold comes and person A gets it, and then person B gets it, and then gives it back to person A. And the diseases of the mind are very much like that. There are germs outside. In some cases, there are germs that we've been used to all the time. We've developed a certain resistance. But then when our resistance gets weak, we become susceptible. Those are cases where your body knows that this is a foreign substance, this germ or this virus coming in. But it just doesn't have the strength to fight it off. There are other cases where it doesn't even know, it doesn't recognize it yet. It invades and can do all kinds of damage before the body recognizes that something's wrong. And that's the way it is with the mind. Sometimes there are things we know are wrong. Certain types of greed, aversion, delusion, lust. And normally we can resist them. But when our resistance is down, when it's weak, they take over. There are other things that sneak into the mind, and we don't recognize them at first as being a problem. They move in and they take over. And only when you realize that you're suffering from them, and sometimes in a big way, do you realize something's wrong, but you don't even know where it came from. So we practice meditation to develop our resistance. The concentration side is to develop the strength of resistance. So we have a sense of well-being inside. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath, try to find ways of breathing that feel good. So the mind is soothed when it needs to be soothed, energized when it needs to be energized, calmed down when it needs to be calmed. That way it feels basically healthy. Other things come in from outside. and. You're just not interested. You've got something good inside already. You're less hungry for whatever little pleasures the, that are offered by greed, aversion, and delusion. So this practice of sitting here breathing in a comfortable way is not a selfish thing. We're not just hiding out from the rest of the world and getting our own little pleasure. We're strengthening the mind so that we can live in the world not come down with the diseases of the world. We look all around us as the media is nothing but greed, aversion, and delusion. I saw a cartoon one time. A man is standing in front of a magazine rack, and the different names of the magazines were the seven deadly sins. And you can probably think of the same sort of thing with the different unskillful mind states the Buddha talks about. There are magazines that are for anger, magazines that are for lust, magazines that are for greed, magazines that are for delusion. They're there all the time. And when our resistance is down, okay, we, we buy them. When they're not, when the resistance is not down, okay, we look past them and don't find them interesting at all. So think of concentration as a way of building your resistance. You've got something good inside that you can carry with you wherever you go. It's only when you have a lapse in mindfulness and you forget that you leave yourself exposed. So you have to be heedful. There, there are germs everywhere, little germs of greed, germs of aversion, germs of delusion, germs of jealousy, envy. They're around us all the time. So you have to keep your resistance up. You have to keep your guard up. They deal with these things. Now, as for the ones you don't recognize, this is where quality comes in. The Buddha calls it analysis of qualities. It's in the factors for awakening. It builds on mindfulness. 
that actually notices what's there and then can analyze this, what's skillful and what's not skillful. Sometimes it's equated with the Four Noble Truths, specifically seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And that doesn't mean just knowing what the Four Noble Truths are, but remembering what they're for. We're trying to divide up our experience so we know what to do with it, because each truth has a duty. Suffering or stress is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. The cessation is to be realized, and you do that by developing the path. Sometimes you hear analysis of qualities paired with mindfulness, which is defined as simply being aware of what's coming up, kind of a bare awareness, and then analysis of qualities, what, what labels are. This is a thought, this is an emotion, this is a distraction, whatever. And then persistence, which is the third factor for awakening, is just keeping at this. But that's not how the Buddha explained it. To begin with, mindfulness is the faculty of the memory. It's not just awareness. It's composed of the things you try to remind yourself that are important to remember if you're going to stay on the path. In particular, you remind yourself you want to abandon unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones. And then analysis of qualities is what actually recognizes what's skillful and what's not. And it does, by, does that by looking at cause and effect. When you develop this particular thought in the mind, where does it take you? If you develop that one, where does it take you? And you analyze it not in terms of whether you like the thought or don't like the thought. You analyze it in terms of where it's coming from in the mind and where it's going what qualities are leading to that kind of thought. The Buddha himself said he got onto the path of awakening by dividing his thoughts into two sorts, those that were imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness on one side, those imbued with renunciation, lack of ill will, i.e. goodwill, and harmlessness, i.e. compassion, on the other side. Basically seeing that these are where these come from, and you know where they go. The first sort, he realized, took the mind into areas where it would want to act in unskillful ways, and the second sort didn't. So you want to learn how to look at your thoughts in terms of cause and effect. Where are they coming from? Where are they going? That's analysis of qualities. And then based on that, then you know what to do in terms of your persistence, which is the third factor for awakening. How to develop skillful qualities, how to abandon unskillful ones, and, and wanting to do it. An important part of persistence is to learn how to motivate yourself. You've seen the harm that can come from certain thoughts, certain ideas, certain urges in the mind. And you realize, you don't, want to stop. you don't want to continue harming yourself that way. You've had enough. At the same time, you've seen the benefits of the more skillful qualities. And you cultivate the desire to develop them more in the mind, realizing that this really is a worthwhile process. Too many people think that, well, whatever goes through the mind just goes through the mind, it comes in, goes out, and that's it. Nobody else knows what's going on in my mind, so it doesn't matter. But it does matter. It shapes, your, it shapes your life, what you're thinking, what thoughts you pursue, which ones you don't. So when you realize that your life matters, the question of your happiness matters, then you can motivate yourself. That's an important part of the persistence. These three qualities, mindfulness, analysis of qualities, and persistence correspond to right mindfulness, right view, right effort. And as the Buddha said, these are the three qualities that circle around every path factor, starting with right view itself all the way through right concentration. So these are the three qualities you want to keep in balance and keep working together, hovering around whatever you're doing. So it's not just concentration. And the factors for waking and concentration is they stood under four factors. There's rapture, serenity, 
concentration and equanimity. And those can help build up a lot of resistance. That's the other three factors, mindfulness, analysis of qualities, and persistence or right effort. Those are the things that help you recognize the germs that you didn't recognize before, the things that you for a long time thought were okay or normal. But now you suddenly realize that these are the beginning points of a lot of trouble. Because you're looking in terms of cause and effect. You step back from the question of whether you like or don't like a particular thought and look at it as a type of action that leads to a result. And you judge it by the results. You're allowed to like and not like certain results, to want and not want certain results. When the Zen master said that the great way is easy for those with no preferences. He wasn't talking about preferences for results. He was talking about preferences for the training itself. In other words, if you're happy to give up things even though you may like them, but if you know that they're going to be bad for you, you teach yourself to be happy to give them up. And it's for things that you may not like to do, but you know they're going to give results, so you learn how to be happy to do them. That's when the great way becomes easy. So it's important to remember that that quality, what it calls analysis of qualities, which is the discernment factor and the factors for awakening, is not simply a matter of noting or recognizing. It's more of figuring things out and knowing that these teachings are meant to be acted on. The things you bring into your mind right here, right now, and they are relevant right here, right now. They may sound abstract, but they're directly related to the health of your mind. When you learn how to see your thoughts in these ways, see your state of mind in these ways, you know how to behave in a way that's going to keep it healthy and keep up your resistance. Because the germs of the mind are different from the germs out in the world. The germs in the world just keep producing more and more and more forms. And even though the germs of the mind are many, they have certain classes, certain types, and it is possible to come to an end of them. So the mind can be in a state of perfect health. That's what the Buddha called nirvana, health. But it's a health that's much more reliable and more resilient than the health of the body. And it's a type of health that once it comes in a religion, with the health of the body, certain times you're okay, certain times you're not okay. And the body's heading to death. There's going to be a point where you, no matter how well you feed it, no matter how well you treat it, exercise it, it's going to die. But the mind doesn't die. Your consciousness keeps going. If you get it to a state of health, though, in the, in the Buddhist sense of the term, then there's no falling back. <laughs>